This is a piece by a guy named Larry Taunton. Larry who? Never heard of her. What sort of a man is he? Pick from Bama. A man like any other, but more so. Well, I thought he was dead. This is the Larry Alex Taunton Show. Let's light this candle. Welcome to the Larry Alex Taunton Show. I am Larry Alex Taunton. And today we're going to be talking about, uh, again, I was uh, I was in Europe for three months uh, earlier this year. And uh, one of the things that I did on this particular journey, in addition to covering the World Economic Forum, uh, among many other things, is I went to Patesht Prison. It looks like Patesti, but it's pronounced Patesht. Patesht Prison in Romania, um, at one time the most terrifying prison in the world. Um, we're going to be talking about that just a little bit. And uh, the reason for that is because it's a place where anti-communists, so-called anti-communists, were um, not only imprisoned but tortured. And uh, many of them were Christians. And if you're familiar with Richard Wormbrand, uh, his book, Tortured for Christ and Marx and Satan, which is another one I would encourage you to read. It's a, um, Marx and Satan is a, is a very small book. You can, you can read it in an afternoon. But it's an excellent, excellent book. You can also find Wormbrand's 1966 ten- Senate testimony um, in which he talks about um, this place. And uh, we're going to be talking about that. Um, But I want to begin the program today by talking about the best movie for these troubled times. What is the best movie for these these troubled times? Is it one of my faves, Honeymoon in Vegas? No. Is it The Matrix? No. Is it Star Wars? No. Gone with the Wind? No. No, I would argue that as a 1961 blockbuster a film by the title Judgment at Nuremberg, 1961. It seems to have almost everybody in it. It has, it stars uh, um, Spencer Tracy and uh, Marlena Dietrich. Uh, William Shatner makes a, uh, a, a minor uh, appearance in it. Burt Lancaster is in it. Montgomery Clift is in it. Maximilian Schell is in it, playing a, uh, playing a major um, role. Richard Widmark is in it. And even, you remember Colonel Clink? Colonel Clink from uh, Hogan's Heroes? He, he plays a villain in this and uh, a very sinister villain in this film. And I want to talk a little bit about the film. We have been saying, I have been saying that in, in times of moral disorientation, you need a fixed point. That's how Blaise Pascal put it. You, you got to have a fixed point, something that sends off bubbles. As I say, when you're, when you are, um, scuba diving, you you look for the bubbles because the bubbles, they train you to do this because the bubbles always go up and it's easy to become disoriented, particularly say if you're in a cave or you're you're in a ship or it's dark, sometimes with a neutral buoyancy, um, you're not quite sure if you're, which way you're going, but the bubbles will always go up. They give you orientation. And there was a time where, and of course for us as Christians, um, it is Jesus Christ, it's the word that gives us orientation. But there was a time when Hollywood occasionally produced films that reinforced the biblical argument. And I would I would say that Judgment at Nuremberg is one of those films. And it's because Judgment at Nuremberg is exploring the question of whether or not morality, which is to say whether or not truth is absolute, that is it fixed for all space and time across all cultures, across all history, um, across uh, all, all country uh, national boundaries, or do we just simply adhere to the national, um, or rather the cultural zeitgeist? Um, zeitgeist, you know, coming from the German word, spirit of the age. Uh, do we just adhere to the cultural zeitgeist? Now, I hear a lot of people say, in fact, I remember asking Richard Dawkins this question when I first met him, uh, the atheist, the famed atheist uh, evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins, when I first met him in um, 2006, um, he was kind enough to host me for coffee in his, his home, and I asked him if he believed the truth was absolute. And as you can imagine, he uh, you know he maintains that biological truth is absolute, 
but he doesn't believe in a God, and therefore the idea of truth, the truth in which I mean it, which is to say moral truth, he does not believe is, is absolute, and therefore he, he believes we adhere to the cultural zeitgeist. I, I'm, I'd be interested to have that conversation with him again because right now he is seeing things moving in a direction that even he finds uh, a deeply unsettling. But this film is exploring that question. So to set up the film and to make you want to watch it, let me just tell you just a little bit about it. Um, first of all, I, I find that many audiences today have a hard time watching this, and not because it's boring. It isn't remotely boring, but this isn't born identity. Things aren't getting blown up, and uh, people aren't getting shot up in, in, in this film. It's very cerebral. It's very intelligent. You have to pay attention, or you'll miss what's going on. But it's the year 1948. It's set in the year 1948. And it's at the tail end of the Nuremberg trials, which took place between 1946 and in 1949. And um, the major war criminals at, at the point covered in this film, the major war criminals have all been tried, executed, or sentenced at this point. So now we're down to just uh, judging the, you know, uh, lesser figures, magistrates and judges and uh, administrators who played a role in the horror uh, that took place in Germany between 1933 and 1945. And Spencer Tracy plays a quote-unquote backwoods main judge uh, f who is asked by a U.S. senator to be uh, one of the judges at um, the trial of German judges, which actually sets things up in a very interesting way. It's American judges trying German judges, German judges who went along with the Nuremberg Laws, which said that Jews should be um, sterilized and um, uh, in some case imprisoned or you know, sent to concentration camps. And these were judges who went along with that. And of course, their defense was to say, we were just simply enforcing the law. We didn't invent law. It's not our place to invent law. We were just simply enforcing the laws that were on the books at the time. And the prosecution is saying, yes, but these were immoral laws. And you went along with these laws. So Spencer Tracy plays this judge. The senator is asked, you know, will will you please come, and we'll put you in this beautiful home, and you know, you'll have the you know, the the United States Army administrators will all be at your beck and call. And he more or less admits to him, you're the last person on my list because I couldn't get anybody else um, to do this. Nobody wants to do this. And at at this point in the trials. The Germans are resenting the trials. They're resenting seeing Germans tried by Americans, and Americans have lost enthusiasm for the trials as well. They're not interested in prosecuting them anymore, and uh, media is barely covering the trials. So Americans at home, if they read anything about them at all, it's in the, it's in the, uh, the back pages of the newspaper. Haywood, that is to say Spencer Tracy, Judge Haywood agrees to this because he wants to understand how how the Holocaust happened in the first place. Is man basically good as he's always believed, or is he is he a devil? Is he does he in fact have a predisposition towards evil? Uh, does he have, you know, as as Augustine put it, um, he's the one who gave us the term original sin from from his reading of uh, Romans chapter five, verses twelve through twenty-one. So Haywood agrees um, to do this. Now, the background to the, to the trials is interesting as it sets it up in this film because what's going on in Germany at this time is the Berlin Airlift. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the Berlin Airlift, Berlin itself was deep into the Russian zone. So Germany is divided into four zones after the war, the French, the British, the American, and the Russian. And Berlin itself, deep into the Russian zone, is divided into four zones. Uh, um, sections as well, the French, British, American, and Russian. And in order to get to it, uh, trains pass through what was called the, uh, I think it's called the Berlin Corridor, in order, to, uh, in order to get to it. So the Russians, what started the Berlin airlift was the Russians closed off the corridor, so the, the only way to reach Berlin would be by air, and the intent was to strangle Berlin, um, suffocate it, starve the German population there uh, until the United States, the British, and the French agreed 
to surrender the whole of Berlin to the Russians. But the Russians did not count on the extraordinary capacity, logistical capacity of the United States to have planes taking off, I want to say, like every 30 seconds. It's something insane like that. But, but, but planes taking off, the point is, around the clock, feeding an entire population from the air, dropping supplies into Berlin. And so Judge Haywood is told, you know, in no uncertain terms by the senator, look, we really need the support of the German people because this might be World War III. And the German people really don't like seeing harsh sentences being meted out to their, you know, to their own people. So, you know, maybe you'll kind of bear this in mind. Richard Widmark uh, plays, uh, uh, I think his name's Tad Lawson, who was a prosecutor for the Americans, a hard, uh, excuse me, a battle-hardened uh, veteran of the Second World War, a man who had seen the concentration camps, Buchenwald in particular, and who was a Harvard Law graduate. And he's the prosecutor, and he wants blood. And then you have Maximilian Schell, who won an Oscar for his, his role of the German defense attorney, whose whole defense is to obfuscate and to create uh, a kind of murky morality surrounding all of this. I mean, didn't everybody do some terrible things during the war? Um, you know, Germany was fighting for its own life. I mean, who are you to judge us? You guys had slavery in America, and you in, interned the Japanese into your concentration camps. You can't judge us. You, you don't stand on any moral high ground. So that's his defense. But in the background are all the political things that are, are taking place. And the way the film is setting this up, it is showing our hero, Spencer Tracy, Judge Haywood, as a guy who's getting pressure from all sides. William Shatner is, is an order, or excuse me, an, an aide who is assigned to him, a U.S. Army aide who is dating a German girl and who reminds him, look, uh, you know, uh, maybe you could go easy on the German people in, uh, in, in this trial. I mean, these guys didn't actually kill anybody, did they? And then you have um, an American general who's putting pressure uh, on the prosecution. Hey, go easy on the Germans in, in the dock. And then you have uh, a romance between Spencer Tracy, Judge Haywood, and Madame Berthold, who is played brilliantly by Marlena Dietrich. And she is a woman who is, uh, who is cultured. She's intelligent. Um, she's a woman that Judge Hay, who, he's a widower. She's a widow. Her husband had been a German general who was hanged at the earlier portions of the, uh, the Nuremberg trials. And the result of that is that she's a woman who, um, who thinks that the trials are unfair and she wants to... Um, convince Judge Haywood that all Germans are not terrible people. So he's getting pressure politically. He's getting it personally. He's getting it from his friend who is a U.S. senator. And the question becomes, as you watch the film, I've given you no spoilers, the question becomes, as you watch the film, will Judge Haywood maintain the line or is he going to do what the Nazis themselves do, did, which is to say he begins to realize those conditions which led to the Holocaust in the first place are happening all over again. Political uh, circumstances are lending themselves to justification for that which is politically expedient, and that is doing that which is immoral. I'm reminded of something that a uh, uh, British politician uh, of the 19th century once said. I think it was Lord Ribblesdale, but maybe it was Lord Shaftesbury. Maybe it was neither. It doesn't matter. But who said this? What is morally right cannot be politically wrong. And what is morally wrong cannot be politically right. Let me repeat that. What is morally right cannot be politically wrong. And what is morally wrong cannot be politically right. We would do well to remember that in this day and age. I would encourage you to watch this film. Judgment at Nuremberg won several Oscars. Uh, it is absolutely fantastic. It's a film that gives off bubbles. I mean, it, it gives you orientation in these murky times. 
and it reminds you of the courage that it, it took in order to try some of these war criminals. Because the sense is, sometimes people will guilt you with your own sin that you're not able to judge. Hey, I knew you. I went to college with you. I, I remember the people you slept with. I remember you smoked some marijuana. I remember you. You're not so hot. You're not so great. Who are you to judge? Our Lord commanded us to judge by right judgment. That's a difference between, between that and being judgmental. We're not talking about being legalistic. We're talking about holding the moral line. We're all called to endeavor to do it. We'll be back in a moment. And when we do, we'll talk about Patesht Prison. This is the Larry Alex Taunton Show. This is the Larry Alex Taunton Show. Larry is my favorite player. This is the Larry Alex Taunton Show, and I, not coincidentally, I'm Larry Alex Taunton. And uh, I want to turn the conversation now from the best movie for you to watch in these murky times, which uh, I think I just said was Judgment at Nuremberg. By the way, another one that I think is terrific, if people haven't seen this film, is it's a newer film. And, uh, and it's, with the, it's, it's with one of the biggest lefties of them all, Sean Penn. Sean Penn, and it's called The Professor and the Madman. It's based on a true story. It's a film that is done by Mel Gibson. It is based on a true story, and it is shot straight through with grace. Straight through with grace. It is a moving film. It is a powerful film of grace, and I would really encourage you to watch that film. It's not political. That, that film doesn't have any, any political motivation. But, you know, we are in the age. We are in the age of social justice warriors, and social justice warriors, when they penetrate the church, they pervert the church. And the way they pervert the church is they pervert the gospel. It isn't even that they have to be doing it intentionally. We have many pastors in the pulpit these days, many pro uh, professors in our seminaries, who aren't ministers of the gospel. They're social justice warriors. And social justice isn't Christian. That term, you don't find that term anywhere in Scripture. Uh, the Bible's about redemption. The Bible's about justice. The Bible's about grace. It's about loving your neighbor, but it's not about social justice. And uh, people, people who see themselves as uh, social justice warriors, they see themselves as agents of retribution. That is so contrary to the gospel. It's contrary to the spirit of the gospel. Imagine, for instance, if Corey Ten Boom, you know, who wrote The Hiding Place, had written that book from the standpoint, this might be an article right here, this might be an article right here. Imagine reinterpreting Corey Ten Boom's The Hiding Place as a book that was written by a woman who was a social justice warrior. Because the whole book would be about revenge. The whole book would be about revenge. And by the way, Judgment at Nuremberg, I am told, is free right now on Amazon Prime. There we go. Don't buy anything from Amazon, but you can go watch this film free on Amazon Prime. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised it's out there because the film is about absolute truth. The film is about absolute truth, and there can only be absolute truth if there is a God. We must have a primary mover unmoved if we are to have absolute truth. Anyway, um, you know, if you were to read The Hiding Place from the perspective, which is a story of a woman, grace and mercy, you, you recall where she confronts I mean, this is a woman who's in a concentration camp, and she confronts her jailer. And what is the jailer? Remind me, is the jailer, did, did the jailer also torture her sister? Her sister was murdered in the concentration camp. Maybe not. But the point is, she had the power to confront him and forgive him. How powerful is that? But if it's a social justice warrior, it's all about revenge. That, that becomes, that becomes um, what's that film that, that is so many... Gen Zers and Millennials love and Glorious Bastards. Isn't that the name of that movie with um, with Brad Pitt? Yeah. And that movie is all about revenge. It's that's that's what that movie is all about. It's funny because two films that I uh, that are are fairly similar and that people two books that people often mistake as being the same or I mean not the same but very similar are um, The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas, which is, you know, I love the film with uh, the guy who played Jesus, Jim Caviezel. That's a, that's a fun film. The Count of Monte Cristo. There's also an old uh, um, miniseries version of that that's, that's uh, 
back in the uh, the seventies or eighties, which is uh, which is pretty good. Uh, but sometimes people confuse that with Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. And the two are not the same because I would say that that two that are more similar are Ben Hur, Lou Wallace, General Lou Wallace's um, Ben Hur, which was written in the 19th century as well, is much more similar to the Count of Monte Cristo. And that's for this reason because in both of those books and in both of those films, the main character finds redemption and grace after he's gotten revenge. <laughs> So he he suddenly is prepared, you know. Um, ben Hur is prepared to uh, to show grace and mercy to Marcellus once he's driven his chariot straight over him. Um, he doesn't find grace and movie, uh, excuse me, grace and forgiveness prior to that in a Corey Ten Boom fashion. And in uh, Victor Hugo's Les Mis, he shows grace and mercy to Javert long before. And uh, so, so those two are those two are quite different. Um, all three of them are very entertaining. But if you're looking for one that really is about grace, I would say that that Victor Hugo's Les Mis is, has much more of a message of grace in it than does than does the Count of Monte Cristo or Ben Hur. But um, but anyway, um, the Professor and the Madman with uh, Mel Gibson is terrific and is worth watching. But it's important to understand that distinction because. If you want to understand why social justice warriors are fundamentally godless in their ideology, it's because the gospel just simply doesn't figure into it. And the gospel is, is salvation is, is, is about repentance, and it's about receiving God's grace and mercy. And if you don't understand that, it means you don't understand your offense to God. I, I try to remember that all the time. I, I try to remind myself how deep is my offense against God. And when, when I recognize that, I'm going to be more inclined to show mercy. I'm going to be more inclined to show grace to other people. Most of us grade ourselves on a curve. We say, you know what? I'm not as bad as, uh, as most people. I'm not as good as some. But I'm a pretty good guy. We grade ourselves on a, on a curve. The Lord does not grade on a curve. It's absolute. We are all fallen. Romans 3, together we have turned aside. Together we have become worthless. And that is because we have a bent towards evil. We're born with it. We're not born basically good. Yeah, listen to sinners in the hands of an angry God. <laughs> Which, did you know that accounts of the way that was put? John, Jonathan Edwards, we're told, was not screaming from the pulpit that he was he was speaking in a very calm yep just as calm as he could be in reading it but but he pounded away at you with biblical logic and he led you to the point and th this is what this is what we need right now we need our Jonathan Edwards in the pulpits to spark a great awakening who are reminding people of the doctrine of hell Darwin McCullough Darwin McCullough who's not a believer by the way he's a Cambridge historian he wrote a book called The Reformation it's a big, it's, it's a terrific book. It's a big book. He may even be an atheist. But he says this at the end of the book. He's talking about the decline of Christianity in the West, and he says this. He says that it is, uh, it is uh, that, that the decline uh, corresponds to a doctrine that evangelicals have quietly dropped from their pulpits, the doctrine of hell. We need to reclaim the doctrine of hell. And, uh, and that's because it's a part of Scripture. point isn't to, to do it to be sensational or to terrify people. It's just to remind them that it's real. If you care about people, you, you want them to know that. Penn Gillette, the atheist, you know, um, you know, said in a, a, one of his own little video blogs, if you believe this hell is real and you can't be bothered to tell other people that, what kind of person are you? What kind of person are you? So we have to be willing to do that, and the doctrine of hell um, is what stirred on, uh, um, you know, spurred on rather. I guess it stirred it too, stirred hearts, as uh, as uh, suddenly John Wesley said, stirred my heart was strangely stirred, strangely moved. It's what um, spurred on the Great Awakenings, the first and second Great Awakening, and we uh, we need another one, which means that we need the dot the the full counsel of Scripture to be preached. And that leads me to those individuals, those Christians who stood their ground in the communist world, and boy, did they suffer for it. Uh, I um, was, you know, recently in Rome. Uh, excuse me, I was in Europe. I was in Rome too, but I was in in Europe for um, three months. I was there covering the World Economic Forum, working on a book on the World Economic Forum. 
Uh, I was in France and Spain and uh, Switzerland, obviously. Uh, I was in Italy. Uh, had some very interesting encounters at the Vatican. And uh, I was also in, uh, in Poland um, taking a look at, some of you have seen my interviews on, you know, with Steve Bannon, um, with Eric Metaxas, with uh, Washington Watch, with Tony Perkins, um, Chad Prather, several others in which I was talking about this. I was talking about these things. And, um, but one of them that I haven't talked about yet at all, though I have written an article that is published on my website at LarryAlexTaunton.com is an article that I've titled, A Visit to the Most Terrifying Prison in the World. And so I, uh, I'd been wanting to go to this place for quite some time since reading Richard Wormbrand, you know, Richard Wormbrand who wrote in, I think it's in the late 60s or maybe in the 70s, a book titled Tortured for Christ. Many of you have read it or you're familiar with it. He wrote another book called uh, Marx and Satan. He was a Romanian Lutheran pastor, and he had suffered under, he and his wife had suffered under the German occupation. So the Germans had overrun the country, so the fascists um, had control of the country, and they had suffered under, you know, fascist domination. And then the Soviets drove them out, and the Soviets took control of Romania. And so they suffered, because both of those ideologies, which are, you know, um, different sides of the same coin, fascism and Marxism, um, communism, both of them are fundamentally godless. They're atheistic at their heart, and thus they, are, they hate God. Romans 1 speaks of haters of God. These people are haters of God. And so uh, he was imprisoned, um, Richard Wormbrand, and he talked about um, Patesh Prison, what a horrifying place it was. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who won the, you know, who's Russian, not Romanian, who won the 1970 Nobel Prize for Literature, he said this, he said that Patesh prison was a place of the most terrible acts of barbarism in the contemporary world. Now, Alexander Solzhenitsyn was never imprisoned there. But Solzhenitsyn, who wrote the Gulag Archipelago, he, uh, he wrote Cancer Ward, um, several other books, um, A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, and others, Solzhenitsyn knew what communist imprisonment and terror looked like. And yet here's Solzhenitsyn saying, Patesht prison. And it looks like, if you want to look it up, it's, it's spelled P-E-S-T, excuse me, excuse me P-E-T-E-S-T-I. It looks like Patesti, but it's pronounced Patesht, Patesht. And here's Solzhenitsyn, who had suffered a lot, saying, that place, that place was a place of the most unspeakable horrors in the world, and uh, it certainly was. And so I flew into Bucharest. I uh, I then hired a car and I I drove out. It's maybe it's maybe it's about a two hour drive out to the prison. What's interesting is that, and I also think somewhat depressing is that no Romanian I spoke to. I mean, until I got to the prison itself, which is a memorial now, but not a memorial that the that the Romanian government recognizes. They do not. They do not want to officially recognize it. So the concierge at my hotel, and a concierge at a hotel, like a real concierge, um, at this hotel where I was uh, this staying, you know, Hilton or Hyatt or whatever it was, they're usually extremely knowledgeable. You know, plays, taxis, um, airlines, um, tourist sites, places to go, things to do. When I brought this place up, had no idea what I was talking about. And he knew the town because there is a town by the name of Patesht. And he said, you know, I know the town, but a prison memorial, never heard of it. So I began asking around people who were older and younger. Now, some of the older crowd did know about it. They had heard about it. And they were the kind of people you'd watch almost go, you know, when, when you, you'd mention it. But when you were speaking to younger people, they had no idea what you were talking about. And, uh, and why say that that's... Um, troubling is because it means they're not being taught their own history. I remember in 1989 when Nikolai Ceausescu, I may not be saying that right, but anyway, when Nikolai Ceausescu, who was the, the decades-long dictator of Romania, and you have at this point in uh, beginning in 1988 and continuing through to the fall of the Soviet Union, <clears throat> in 1991, 
you have Soviet republics that are declaring freedom and are falling like dominoes, and they're breaking away from the Soviet Union, declaring independence from Gorbachev's, um, you know, Russia. And uh, Nikolai Ceausescu and his wife tried to escape by helicopter um, from the rooftop, and they did. They did manage to escape briefly, but then they were caught and they were executed um, by the Romanian government. And uh, I remember that. I remember it vividly. And now here I am in Romania, and I'm talking to, let's say, 20 and 30-somethings. So one's, uh, people not old enough to remember the events, maybe even weren't even alive at the time, but it's recent history, and you would think they would know it. You'd think they'd have been taught it. I don't seem to have any idea. So I'm asking for directions to, you know, the, uh, the old communist uh, a building where Ceausescu, um, where his office was, where he took off in the helicopter, these kinds of things. If you knew the name of the building, they would know that. But if you, if you mention it from a historical point of view, they really don't know anything about that. And I find that troubling because the German government, I don't know if this is true anymore, but when I received um, a... Um, a national fellowship years and years ago. Um, I received a fellowship to study the intellectual origins of the Holocaust, and I was very grateful for that. It was a, it was a basically a Fulbright for teachers, and it sent me sent me abroad. Um, and I went to several of the concentration camps at uh, at that time: Buchenwald, Mittelbach, Dora, Auschwitz, um, Dachau. Um, Mauthausen. Um, there may have been others that I visited. Those are the ones that I remember off the top of my head. And my son Michael was with me. He's just a little boy, you know, at the time, just a just a wee lad. But he went along, and um, and uh, we have both have very fond memories of of that trip, but not of the uh, um, of the Holocaust memorials. And I was so grateful for the fact that the German government required high school students to see them. You had to see. There was a requirement that you had to go to a concentration camp before you graduated. I would bet that requirement has since been dropped because the, um, the German government increasingly doesn't want to preserve those sites. And you, as a result, you're seeing an increase in a number of Holocaust deniers, people who think that these things didn't, aren't real or that the, the films are fabricated or the, the whole thing was some kind of Jewish conspiracy. It's complete nonsense. Hey, if you want to believe in conspiracies, look into vax mandates. Look into what the World Economic Forum is doing. You will find actual conspiracies against global populations there. Uh, the, the 2020 election, I mean, good heavens, you talk, about a, you talk about a conspiracy. This stuff is legit. The Holocaust happened, ladies and gentlemen. It absolutely happened. Roughly 8 million people being executed by the Nazi regime. We'll be back in just a moment, and when we are, we will uh, discuss the most terrifying prison in the world. This is the Larry Alex Taunton Show. We'll be back. This show, this ministry, is supported by viewers like you. And if you appreciate my work, if you think that what we do at Fixed Point Foundation, if you think that what we do on the Larry Alex Taunton Show is helpful to you, please help us. You can uh, make a fully tax-deductible contribution and help us pay for all that it takes, pay for Matt's salary and pay for me being here and for the production of this show. Thank you very much for your viewership and for watching. Welcome back to the Larry Alex Taunton Show. It is uh, it is great to be back. It's great to be back in in the United States. You know, I've been gone for uh, for so long, and I know that for for many of you, my work looks very glamorous. Um, it looks it looks very glamorous, and uh, I, that's not to say that travel is all bad. I these days, you know, when I was younger, I didn't mind you know sleeping on the in a train station, sleeping in a bus station. I did that multiple times, sleeping on a train, on a bus, um, piling in with a bunch of other students into a, uh, uh, a youth hostel. I've, I did all those things. Uh, and eating, I remember the first time I back, back through Europe when I, was, uh, when I was an undergraduate, I had so little money <laughs> that I, uh, I would buy, you know, because the, the bakeries in Europe are wonderful. It's their equivalent of fast food except it's better for you. It's better. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I just came back and, um, and there's some, you know, some boar's head lunch meat or something in the refrigerator. 
And, um, and I ate some of that yesterday and I began thinking to myself, how is it that stuff is still good three months later, three months later. And it's because of course, it's just absolutely shot through with chemicals. You buy a loaf of bread in, in a, in a French bakery and a, an Italian break bakery. Um, it's stale the next day. It's stale the next day. And, uh, and in fact, those people who frequent those bakeries, uh, bakeries, the reason those bakeries usually close in the middle of the day is because they're preparing, you know, product for that night. So bakers, you know, are up at like 3 a.m. so that they're able to open at 6 a.m. And then they close, you know, briefly and they go take a nap and then they go and make more product in order to have it out, you know, for the late afternoon. And it's fresh. But if you go and, you know, put that thing in a Ziploc bag and the next day think it's going to be good... It, it'll be okay, but it's going to be crunchy and stale. It's just not going to, and it's because it doesn't have any of that stuff in it. So it's uh, it's very different. But anyway, when I was traveling through Europe, I would buy like a a big loaf of bread, chunk of cheese, um, French or Italian or German cheese, and I would I would I would put it in a Ziploc bag, and I, and I carried I took with me peanut butter, and that is pretty well all I ate. And, um, you know, at that age, you're fine. You, you do, you do okay with that. So that's what, uh, that's what I did then these days. I'm not staying in places like that. I'm not eating like that. I'm, I'm fortunate to, to say that I can stay in decent hotels and I can eat at restaurants. And, uh, and that's, that's good because I'm just, uh, I'm just at this point in my life and it's particularly post-accident. You know, after after breaking so many bones, after breaking 19 vertebrae, I, I'm choosing restaurants almost on the basis of of their comfort level as much as I am for the quality of their food. Unless it's food, I don't, unless excuse me, unless it's it's uh, it's fish. If it's seafood, I don't care how comfortable your chairs are. I'm not eating there. Uh, I have friends who give me a hard time for that, but I just simply won't eat fish. So. We're talking about the most terrifying prison in the world. And I was telling you, I was telling you that um, this place pretty much had been uh, Pitesh Prison, spelled P-I-T-E-S-T-I. Looks like Pitesti. It's um, Pitesh, Pitesh Prison in Romania. Uh, I could find, I couldn't find anyone other than when I got to the memorial itself. I could find no one who knew of this place, who knew where it was. They just had no idea of it. And I find that to be troubling because its history is something that should be taught, should be taught in American schools. I certainly teach my students. I've taught my students about the Holocaust. Um, and they should be taught this. And Patash Prison, why, why someone like Solzhenitsyn would say that it's the, most, uh, the place of the most terrible acts of barbarism in the contemporary world is because it was. And uh, it's fitting that it sits, you know, it practically sits, Matt, in the shadow of Vlad the Impaler's castle. And it's, it's a little bit of an exaggeration to say it's literally in the shadow. That, that, that castle is probably about an hour away. But uh, Vlad the Impaler, uh, the, uh, the Transylvanian king, a nobleman, he, uh, he became the basis of Bram Stoker's Dracula, fictitious figure Dracula. And Castle Dracula was based on, um, you know, Vlad the Impaler's castle. He had more than one, and the, uh, the one in question is actually quite near Patesh Prison. So uh, it's, that this is, a, this is a, a region of this country that has a history of, he has a very bloody, bloody history and um, I wanted to go to this place because just as I had gone to the, uh, to the concentration camps, I really wanted to honor those men. And I, there were some women, I think, who passed through um, this prison. But I wanted to honor these, these people who had suffered in this prison. Uh, whether they were Christian or not, uh, many of them were Christians, but I wanted to honor them. Um, because we need, the, the, while the Romanian government wants to forget this place, it's important that we don't. It's important that we not forget these things. And it's because, ladies and gentlemen, if you think there's something, 
broken in uh, in in the, the the German gene pool, something broken in their character, something that's wrong with with um, the Russian character or the Romanian character, the Chinese character. I'll uh, loosely quote William Golding, who was the author of Lord of the Flies, who said, and he didn't put this in his book. I actually happened to find this online. I was doing a little research on that book because I was teaching it. And I happened to find, you know, publishers, when I'm submitting a book, they have me write, you know, what's the book about? You know, what's my target audience? What's my goal with the book? You know, who are the main characters? This kind of thing. It's sort of a synopsis is what you'd call it. And so he was asked, what is the book about? The Lord of the Flies. And he said, the book is about this, that the flaws uh, of human the flaws of, of human society are the flaws of human nature. It's a brilliant line. The flaws of human society are the flaws of human nature, meaning we could take the very best people. God did this once, you know. We could get the very best representatives of humanity and go and colonize the moon, and in less than a generation, it'll be off the rails again. This is why it's necessary to have, we speak of the Reformation, the Reformation with a capital R. The fact is there are need for reformations all along the line. There's a constant need for reformations. Um, we, you know, maybe, maybe not with a capital R, but there is a need for, for periodic, periodic um, reformations. And by that, I mean where you break away and you say enough is enough. We're starting over. You could say the American Revolution, which was more of a civil war, was a kind of reformation. It's saying, look, we can't fix what's broken in the institution, so we're starting again. Uh, the very splits uh, uh, among uh, Presbyterians, many of them are reformations. Uh, among Baptists, those are reformations. Uh, they, are, they are saying, you know, the reformation is where Martin Luther said, look, we were trying to change the institution, the Catholic Church from within, now we will start over from without. John Calvin, the same thing. They were hoping to bring Reformation from within the church, but having failed that, at, along with the conciliar movements and, and uh, you know, several other attempts, uh, John Wycliffe's uh, attempts to bring, uh, John Huss attempts to bring Reformation from within the church itself, they went outside the church. So there's always a need for reformations. And my point simply being this, that your human nature is flawed, it's broken. Uh, you know the woman who does the AT&T ads? I've always kind of liked her. I always thought she's kind of cute and uh, seems quite sweet. Not anymore. She put on uh, social media, I don't know which platform, but you probably find it on them all, a rant, a rant in which she's basically calling red staters a bunch of fascists. And in her rant, she says this, she says, I believe people to be basically good. What an absolute load of nonsense. See, even my dog thinks that that's the case. What an absolute load of nonsense. And it's an evil doctrine. Did you know that? It's an evil doctrine to say that man is basically good. It sounds very compassionate to say that. But it's done more to wreck the world than... Maybe any other ideology, because that ideology pollutes other ideologies. George Bernard Shaw, for instance, would sort of, uh, you know, who's a hardline communist, he would kind of take that view. And the reason that it's, uh, it's, it's an evil doctrine to believe that man is basically good, as opposed to it's, it's, you know, the corrective is to believe that man is basically evil, which is what we as Christians believe. And that one may sound to you like the, um, that may sound to you like that's not compassionate to say that. But it is. And it's because if you take the view, and I'll just use George Bernard Shaw as an example here, uh, who was very clever and a very evil man. As I say, he was a hardline communist. 1931, he is invited by Stalin's government to take a tour of Russia. There were rumors of a state-engineered famine, all of which were true, uh, in, uh, uh, in the you know, the heartland of Russia, in Ukraine in particular. And so, um, and by the way, George Orwell's Animal Farm, uh, I think, is it Mr. Wimper? I think Mr. Wimper is based on George Bernard Shaw, who comes along and tours the Potemkin village, you know, the fake, the, the, all the fakeness um, that's been set up by the, uh, you know, by the, by the authorities. And in this case, we're talking the Russians. 
uh, and goes back and reports that everything's wonderful. Well, this is what George Bernard Shaw did. George Bernard Shaw in 1931 went to Stalin's Russia and uh, they a Potemkin village, if you don't know the term, it's it's like a Hollywood set. It's a fake, it's uh it's 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 that which is fake in order to deceive. And it comes from uh, Catherine the Great's lover and her um, governor of Astrakhan, a man by the name of Gregory Potemkin. And when Catherine was touring um, Astrakhan, he didn't want her to see how terrible everything was. So he gave, they cleaned up all the children, all the people, gave them new clothes. They then created what were basically Hollywood sets in a couple of villages where everything looked wonderful, told all the unclean people to hide. And then her carriage is rolled through and she looks at what she thinks is her magical kingdom because it looked that way. And look, look at how well-dressed my people are. Look at how clean they are. Look at how well-spoken they are. They're all happy. And then, of course, as soon as they left, they took everything away from them and they burned it all down. That's, a, and that's where we get the term, a Potemkin village. It's what's fake. So that when Boris Yeltsin was visiting the United States for the first time, he said, hey, can I see food production? Excuse me, food distribution. He was used to, I mean, we don't even use language like that. We may, you know, before all is said and done. But he said, I want to see, uh, you know, food distribution. Of course, in Russia, you go line up for it, sometimes for hours. And so they said, sure. And they just took him to a, like a local Publix or Kroger's or something. And he said, look, <laughs> I'm a Russian. You can't fool me. This Potemkin village. You guys were prepared for me to say something like this, and you set this up. People can't get kumquats. <laughs> Nobody can get a cantaloupe out of season. Where are you getting all these <coughs> beautiful ripe tomatoes? This is fake. And they said, this was, I think it was in Boston. And, he, and they said to him, no, 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 Mr. President. We take you across town to another one or to another one or to another one. They're all over the place. This is what America's like. And he's like, yeah, whatever. I'm a Russian. You can't fool me with this stuff. I know the truth. So that's a Potemkin village. And often in visiting prisons like Potashed, the prisoners would all be cleaned up. The prison itself would be cleaned up. And they would be beaten to be told, you will say how much you love it here. And that's a little bit like Jeremiah Denton. You know, some will know the story of a man from Alabama who became a, uh, a, a U.S. senator from the state of Alabama who the Vietnamese put on. Was it the Vietnamese or was it the North Koreans? I can't remember. But anyway, he was imprisoned in one or the other. I think it was in Vietnam. And um, the Vietnamese beat him and beat him and beat him, tortured him until he went on camera to say how wonderfully he was being treated. But throughout it, He's blinking his eyes, and somebody realized it was Morse code, and he was it was Morse code that said torture repeatedly. He kept saying torture with his eyes repeatedly. So this kind of thing is uh, it was is often what goes on. And George Bernard Shaw saw the Potemkin village, came back and reported that it was all wonderful. And he when he was asked, yeah, but isn't Stalin killing people? You know what his answer was? He said yes, but he's killing the right people. And what does that have to do with believing that men are basically good? Well, if you believe that men are basically good, then you think the way to create a good society is to just weed out the bad ones. You know, when uh, long ago, when I was uh, um, working Lori, my wife, through college, I worked for a tire company. And they would use, you'd use the term cull to cull out the bad tires. Every, for every 100 tires that are produced, the industry standard was 3% are bad. They're out of, they, they've got a separation uh, in the sidewall or in the tread, or they're out around. And so you culled the bad ones, just as you would your livestock. You, you cull it. And so in the same way, George Bernard Shaw said, look, we just, we just, we just cull the bad ones. And he spoke about the gas chambers. We need, to, we need gas chambers to get rid of bad people. This is the same philosophy that drove Mao's uh, genocides, Stalin's genocides, uh, Hitler's genocides, you know, on and on. This is what drives this. It is the belief that if you can just get rid of the bad people, just at a practical level, we all know this is nonsense. Because if any of us honestly evaluate our own hearts, we know that we're wicked. Most of us don't. Most of us are incapable. 
of honest reflection, as I say, we tend to grade ourselves on a curve. That's the way we typically do such things. But, um, you know, and of course, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We can't fathom the depths of our own wickedness. But if we are, you know, just honest with ourselves, how many times have we thought we have difficult people in our lives and we think to ourselves, you know, if I could just get that person out of my life, my life would just be so much better. And it always seems that that person gets replaced with someone else (laughs) who's just as bad or worse. And um, that is because of human nature being what it is. And um, the fact is that if you ascribe to the doctrine, as the woman with AT&T does, that man is basically good, then you believe that we just got a bunch of fascist red staters. We got to get rid of those people. It is what leads to the justification for genocide. Whereas if you believe that we are all polluted by sin, which is the biblical argument, Read Romans 5, um, verses 12 through 21, where we get the doctrine of original sin, that that sin entered the world through one man, salvation coming through one man. If you believe that, as I do, then you recognize that we all need grace, and it it tends to lead to a gentler world because I recognize that I'm flawed and that you may be too. We'll be back in just a moment. This is The Larry Alex Taunton Show. Welcome back to The Larry Alex Taunton Show. I am Larry Alex Taunton, and I'm talking about Patesht prison in Romania and the doctrine of evil. The doctrine of evil, we have lost the doctrine of evil. We have lost it. And um, the absence of that doctrine has done um, so much damage not just to America, but to the world. And so the result is that we often ascribe um, things to mental illness, which is real, uh, or we just uh, uh, ascribe it to bad you know, governance or something of this nature, when what we're talking about is actually engaging, we're actually engaging with evil, real evil. That's important. But if you believe that man is basically good, you're going to come to the conclusion that all you need to do is just get rid of the bad people. If you ascribe to the biblical view that we are all polluted by sin, then you need you know that we all need to repent and we all need the grace of God. And we need um, the word to give guidance and light, uh, you know, to serve as a lamp unto our feet. So um, that that when when you believe that, you're more inclined to treat your fellow man um, with gentleness, with grace, because you recognize that your fallenness is the same as his fall in this. You recognize that there aren't any of us who say, well, you know, I only needed 25% grace to get into heaven. You needed 75%. No, um, we were all, this is the doctrine of total depravity, which I believe. And the doctrine of total, total depravity says not that we are absolutely depraved, which means that we are as bad as we can be, you know, to the nth degree all of the time, but rather that, that our ability on our own um, to achieve salvation, to commune with God, is totally broken. It's completely broken in a state of sin, and thus we need salvation. Now, I can think of no place on earth that demonstrates total depravity more than Patesht prison in Romania. And this is where anti-communists um, were put, and many of them were Christians. And what we're told about this place is that these individuals who were here, that they were beaten uh, on a regular basis. And by the way, this is part of Marxism. If you think that Marxism has anything in common with Christianity, you are, you are deceived. You are deeply deceived. This is a quotation of Karl Marx. My object in life is to dethrone God and destroy capitalism. Does that sound to you like a guy who's putting forth a philosophy that sounds like some kind of government program that's, uh, you know, a a political expression of Christianity? Absolutely not. Um, In a bad poem, he says that he wants to make himself like the most high. I mean, basically quoting Satan. That's Marxism. Marxism is is fundamentally anti-Christian because Marxism endeavors to, just as he said, to replace God with a godless secular ideology, and not one that's just 
you know, there are individuals that I, I have met, a couple of old professors of mine who, I would, who were atheists, but they're not what I call, they were not what I call ideological atheists. And the distinction being this, they were individuals that if you had said, do you believe in God? They'd have probably said, um, I don't think so. They weren't individuals that you since had thought deeply on the question. They were guys who were, who were very, uh, you know, into their own subject in their own field, thinking very deeply in that. But they, these kind of metaphysical questions, they just didn't engage. They just weren't those kind of guys. Ideological atheists are guys like you know Christopher Hitchens. Um, they're guys like uh, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, the so-called new atheist. Those are individuals who. Um, have made a conscious choice in their atheism, and um, and it it's it defines them as individuals because it's they're aggressive in their atheism. Marxism is ideological atheism. It's fundamentally atheist. It is hostile to God, and there's a reason for that. I love what Francis Schaeffer said. This is an exact quotation, uh, but Francis Schaeffer makes this comment in one of his books. He says that Christians are fundamentally. Um, rebels, and no totalitarian or authoritarian regime can tolerate them. And that's because Christians do not recognize any authority that is higher than God. They do not see the state as God. They do not see the state as the arbiter of all that is um, uh, good and just. So because of that, because we believe that both man and the governments that he makes are subject to God, uh, and to God's absolute law, um, Christians are dangerous to totalitarian regimes. It's why the Chinese have bulldozed Christian churches. It's why Kim uh, Jong-un and his, uh, his father and his grandfather uh, imprisoned Christians. It is why the, the Russia has been historically uh, especially during a really since 1917, since the Bolshevik Revolution, hostile to Christians. And it's why we're seeing it uh, increasingly in the West, increasingly in the United States. We're seeing attacks on Christians. Listen, the attack on the Christian school in Nashville, Biden's government is responsible for that attack. And you may say, how? How can you say that? Democrats are responsible for that. And it is because they are pushing anti-Christian um, rhetoric. They are promoting transgenderism, which is a non-thing. You can't change your, your gender. You are what you are. And they are putting them forward as persecuted peoples. They're doing the same thing with, um, with black Americans, convincing them of their victimhood and filling those people with rage. And thus... A, a, a man who called himself a woman, excuse me, it was a woman, it was a woman, this is very confusing. It was a woman who calls herself a man. She picked up a gun and went into a Christian school in the full belief that she was justified in, in killing Christians because Christians are evil people who do not endorse her fiction, her fantasy world. And thus, she had a right to kill them. In that sense, the United States government is creating terrorists, and we need to push back against it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been great to be with you today. This is the Larry Alex Taunton Show. Join us again next time. Turn out the lights. The party's over. <laughs> they say that all. Ladies and gentlemen. We are grateful for the standing ovation, but there will be no encore for today's performance. Please exit the building in an orderly fashion. Thank you. Honey, can we leave now? <laughs>